Uh, welcome back. I hope you're having a great day. I hope that you're enjoying these lectures. I really miss uh, my students. Uh, sitting here at, at the kitchen table is not nearly the same thing. And in this case, when I'm looking straight ahead, all I can do is see uh, a picture of me. So clearly this is uh, not, uh, not nearly as much fun, but we do have a national pandemic going on. I I hope all of you are being safe. I hope you're social distancing. I, I, I hope you're washing your hands a lot. There are a lot of people uh, dying around the world. And so the last thing I'm going to do is complain very much uh, about having to make recordings at my kitchen table. Uh, I just want to, before I get into freedom of the press uh, and, and, and prior restraint uh, in this lecture, I do want to just say uh, a, a couple of words to conclude uh, the child pornography discussion. So uh, to summarize that discussion, in Ferber versus New York, the Supreme Court ruled that child pornography, it's obscene, it's not protected by the First Amendment, uh, and that the state has a compelling interest in preventing the exploitation of children. And as I mentioned, I believe that all of us believe that that's true. The Ashcroft case is a lot more complicated uh, because obviously in the Ashcroft case, we're dealing with virtual child pornography. There are no actual children involved. These are computer-generated images that appear to be children. And, and so uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's reason for voting that virtual child pornography is okay was she was claiming that there were no actual children involved. Uh, you could make the argument that uh, that this is fantasy, this is pretend, that this is no different, for example, than a whole variety of video games uh, in which people are maimed and killed and a whole variety of things. Uh, uh, I know in our household when my son was young he had a fascination with a game that I thought was frankly kind of stupid and boring, but he was fascinated by it, Grand Theft Auto. So some might say that this material is like that, it's pretend uh, and therefore it should be okay. Uh, I do think, though, however, that some people would say that this material is different, uh, that this material may feed the appetite of a pedophile, uh, and therefore, even though there is no actual child involved, virtual child pornography may constitute a clear and present danger to society uh, by encouraging this activity. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I think I took... Uh, two psychology courses as an undergraduate, so uh, I don't know uh, when, when I was reading through uh, the psychological literature, some psychologists were saying this is a substitute. Um, child pornography is a substitute for the pedophile for actual children. Other psychologists were saying this feeds the appetite of the pedophile. I don't know. I'm going to stay out of that issue. You can judge that for yourself. Okay, on to a happier topic. Uh, freedom of the press. So we move into our second arena uh, of civil liberties. Freedom of speech was first, and I talked about those three avenues uh, earlier, seditious speech, symbolic speech, and pornography uh, obscenity. You may remember when I was talking about the Constitution earlier, one of the things that I said was that the colonists were largely left alone. Uh, they had some limited self-government, there were colonial legislatures, they had certain property rights, they had certain due process rights uh, in terms of access to the courts and a jury trial, and a whole variety of things that even today we would recognize as civil liberties. But one of the things that the British were very insistent on uh, was... Uh, uh, oversight over the press. Uh, in other words, uh, colonial newspaper men uh, and journalists had to get approval from British officials in advance of publication before they could publish it. Now, when it comes to the Supreme Court and how they view viewed freedom of the press, the Supreme Court has given wide latitude, considerable protection from censorship. It is very, very difficult uh, for the government to censor the adult press uh, in what we call prior restraint, and I'll talk about that in just a second. 
On the other hand, the court has uh, ruled that government can more easily censor what they call the children's press, uh, which the Supreme Court has defined uh, as the press of those below college age. So, for example, high school newspaper people. Now, if we take a look at the issue of censorship uh, in advance, uh, the courts call this prior restraint. So the two concepts are synonymous. They mean the same thing. So if in a, a lecture I mention prior restraint or if I mention censorship, uh, it's the same thing. To what degree can and should the government be allowed to advance material uh, in advance of publication? So the first case, and really the most important uh, of the three that I have listed in your notes, uh, it's not the most famous. Uh, the second case of the three is by far the most famous. But the first one is from a constitutional perspective, the most important. Go back to uh, an overview that I gave you in Civil Liberties, and that was that originally, the Bill of Rights were intended to protect people from the power of the national government only. And it was not until Gitlow versus New York in 1925 that the Supreme Court ruled that you and I were also protected from the power of state and local governments when it came to freedom of speech. Near versus Minnesota is the second of the landmark cases that incorporates freedom of the press. In other words, this is the Supreme Court case where for the first time the Supreme Court tells a state, in this case the state of Minnesota, that prior restraint violates freedom of the press, that in this particular case you, Minnesota, must respect press rights to the same degree as the national government. So let me give you uh, some facts. I didn't list them uh, in your notes. I just basically told you why it was important. Uh, but here's basically uh, the facts of this case. Uh, so Jay Neer operates a, a newspaper called the Saturday Press. Uh, it is a racist newspaper. Uh, Mr. Neer in numerous uh, publications uh, makes the claim uh, that Jews are kind of cavorting around with mafioso types and that the Jews were running the city of Minneapolis. Uh, in another uh, editorial, uh, Mr. Neer claimed that the chief of police uh, was taking bribes. Uh, in another, uh, he referred uh, to the governor uh, as being incompetent. Uh, and so the city of Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota shut down uh, his printing press. Uh, the state of Minnesota claimed uh, that the paper violated uh, a state law, that it was malicious, that it was racist, uh, and that they had uh, an interest uh, in uh, shutting down this newspaper uh, that was printing malicious uh, and false claims uh, about public officials. Uh, Mr. Neer's attorneys uh, made the claim uh, that uh, in, in this case the uh, speech, the newspaper was being shut down uh, by the state of Minnesota uh, because they found his ideas offensive and disagreeable, uh, that the founding fathers gave the press uh, wide authority uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, to, to publish, uh, and that the state's action was the essence of censorship. Uh, and that is what Charles Evans Hughes said in this case. Charles Evans Hughes uh, wrote the opinion in Near versus Minnesota. Uh, he claimed that the state of Minnesota's uh, actions was the essence of censorship uh, and that it was prohibited uh, by the First Amendment. Uh, and that prior restraint did indeed uh, violate that very fundamental freedom of the press that was guaranteed uh, in the First Amendment. Uh, the second case uh, is the more famous case, the New York Times uh, versus the United States. 
Uh, Daniel Ellsberg uh, was one of 36 authors working uh, on a massive document uh, called the Pentagon Papers. Uh, the Pentagon Papers uh, uh, came to the conclusion uh, that the Vietnam War was accelerating uh, and not ending as President Johnson and later President Nixon uh, had claimed. Uh, Ellsberg was so offended by the findings uh, of the Pentagon Papers that he leaked the not quite the entire document, but he leaked over 7,000 pages uh, of the Pentagon ba Papers to the New York Times. And, and the New York Times published uh, the first article, uh, which basically was an expose that uh, both Presidents Johnson and Nixon were lying about our involvement in the war. Uh, the New York Times published its first article in June, I believe it was June 13th of 1971. Uh, in this case, Mr. Nixon uh, made the claim that he was protecting national security. Uh, the New York Times uh, made the claim that there were no national security secrets involved in the Pentagon Papers, that the vast majority of the information was historical, uh, and that in this particular case, uh, what was going on uh, in, in this case was that the government was trying to prohibit uh, the publication of these papers because they were politically embarrassing. The Supreme Court uh, was highly divided. All nine justices wrote a separate opinion in this case. So it was a six to three opinion. Uh, and in this case, they allowed the New York Times to publish the Pentagon Papers, even though the Pentagon Papers were classified top secret and classified documents. So uh, it was uh, uh, really a, uh, a, a very intriguing uh, decision by the, the court. Uh, it was surprising by some. Uh, what's most interesting to me uh, after this is that Daniel Ellsberg became somewhat of a celebrity uh, and the Nixon people decided to go after Mr. Ellsberg. Uh, Mr. Nixon's people, for example, uh, broke into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, Dr. Fielding, looking for dirty, incriminating secrets. Uh, they didn't find anything uh, that was very good, uh, and so they moved on. Uh, Nixon's people then uh, uh, inquired uh, with the CIA about possibly getting some LSD-25, which they wanted to put uh, into Ellsberg's soup during a speaking, a speaking engagement. Uh, the CIA told uh, Nixon's people that this was a very unstable variant of the drug and that when they had done this in the past, the results had been unpredictable. And so Nixon's people called this off and, and they never engaged in the drugging uh, whatsoever. But it is kind of frightening to think that Daniel Ellsberg had uh, irritated Nixon's people to such a degree that they took extraordinary measures to attempt to discredit uh, a, a political uh, and domestic enemy uh, as they saw it. So uh, even though Near versus Minnesota is by far uh, the more uh, important case from a constitutional perspective, uh, the New York Times versus the U.S. case, or it's, as it's usually called, the Pentagon Papers, uh, may actually be the historically more interesting case uh, because a, a lot of people who are experts on Watergate say that if you want to understand uh, the genesis, if you want to understand uh, where Watergate began, where Nixon's enemies list began, uh, a lot of experts on Watergate, and I worked for one many years ago uh, at UC Davis, his claim was that in this particular case, uh, some of Mr. Nixon's own justices, people that he had nominated to the court, voted against him in this case. Uh, and the thought was, uh, if even my own Supreme Court justices have voted uh, against me in this case, then I really am surrounded by enemies. And we really do have to have a siege mentality in the White House. And so this case uh, has tentacles that extend well beyond the Supreme Court.